Awesome. All right. Um, thanks, Jenny. So I just want to make maybe one quick announcement before I introduce um, Isla, and that would be that just to encourage everybody to, to go into mute um, during the talk, just so um, sometimes uh, we'll get feedback uh, if you're not on mute. So I encourage you just to, to mute yourself. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to, to maybe introduce um, uh, Isla, but before that, I kind of wanted to to talk a little bit about the motivation for this kind of webinar, which is somewhat a little bit different than some of the webinars we've focused on in the past in the in the PISMET panel. And so um, one of the efforts that the panel um, has been looking at, as well as US Clivar and in, in general over the last few years, is kind of you know uh, looking and, and watching the um, the the progress that's occurred in, in climate modeling. Obviously that's a big part of, of the PISMET panel, but also um, particularly as it as it pertains to you know the improvements in models and, and, and improvements in our under scientific understanding um, and and so out of this effort uh, this we thought this was a perfect time um, to have a webinar on, on other frameworks available within climate models for, for understanding uh, and so uh, our first webinar here will be presented by Isla Simpson um, Isla is a a scientist at NCAR um, in Boulder where she's been um, in the climate and global dynamics lab um, since 2015. Uh, she came to NCAR from Columbia University in Lamont Observatory, uh, where she was a, a postdoc um, after, after being a postdoc at the University of Toronto and before that um, doing her PhD at Imperial College in London. Um, Isla has a, a lot of research focus uh, uh, across a, a wide range of phenomena in the atmosphere, including um, some work on, on mid-latitude um, storms, as well as, as looking at kind of, you know, the variability uh, in climate um, at scales ranging from planetary to regional. Um, but the focus of her talk today is going to be on this new effort within um, the CESM framework um, to develop kind of simpler models for, I think, uh, for understanding. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to Isla. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation to give this webinar uh, on simpler models within CESM. So what I'm going to present is very much uh, the result of work from many different individuals. Uh, hopefully I've got most of them here, um, but I'm probably missing some. Uh, so these are people both from NCAR and then university collaborators that have contributed to get uh, simpler models available within CESM. So um, just a brief motivation, why is there a need for simpler models? Well, as I'm sure you're all aware, our Earth system models have really increased massively in complexity. And so the models we're dealing with now just are covering a wide range of complex processes. Uh, and as was pretty nicely put by Isaac Held in his BAMS paper in 2005, as you have this increasing Sorry, there's some leaf blowing going on. I hope you can, or some grass cutting, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, yeah, so as you have this increase in complexity, you start to have this gap between our abilities to simulate the system and our abilities to understand it. Um, and then of course, I'm just gonna move because I'm sure you're hearing this uh, leaf blowing. <laughs> um, at the same time, as we increase this complexity, um, that comes with an increased computational cost. And I just have an example here for some of the NCAR models, the atmospheric component, um, where you see in the black numbers is the cost in core hours per year. And then the red, um, perhaps more intuitive, those are numbers in the cost of unit of CAM4. And so CAM4 is the atmospheric model that was released in 2010. And so we've gone in the last decade from CAM4 to CAM5 to CAM6, and that has re resulted in an increase in cost of about tenfold. And then those are low-top models. So then if you wanted to have middle atmosphere, you would use Wacom. And if, if you didn't care about chemistry, you could run the specified chemistry version of Wacom, which is that SC Wacom box, which comes in about double the cost of CAM. Uh, but if you wanted coupled chemistry, then it's we're looking at the full Wacom 6 and it's really a, a beast of a model coming in at about 65 times the cost of CAM4. So these costs are pretty approximate but um, I mean you pay for what you get, get so these models, the more expensive ones are including more processes, they're hopefully getting things more correct 
But at the same time, it's very difficult to start to dig in and understand their behavior, do parameter sweeps or sensitivity tests uh, within those complex models. And so there's a need for simpler models to kind of understand the system. And I think this appeals to two somewhat partially overlapping groups of people. Uh, on the one side, you have climate dynamicists, and this is the side that I'm coming from. And so these are people that want to gain a comprehensive understanding of the full system. So they like the simpler models because they're cheap to run and they're easy to perturb. And so you can change one thing, you can look at how the system responds, and you can gain that understanding through lots of different sensitivity tests and perturbation experiments, and then try and apply that understanding to the full system. On the other hand, these idealized configurations are extensively used by model developers. So obviously, as soon as you change one thing in the model, you don't want to then have to go and um, you know, run a climate length simulation to see what it does. You want to gain understanding of the sensitivities or debug particular parameterizations in a cheaper, more controlled framework. Um, and so these are used a lot for that purpose. Uh, an example as well is that there's a, the dynamical core model intercomparison project where many different dynamical cores from all over the world were put on an equal footing with a very simple physics packages and simple experiments that then allowed their numerics to be compared in an idealized setting. So um, a kind of a very brief history of simpler models within CESM. This effort was really spearheaded by Amy Clement and Lorenzo Polvani back in about 2014, and they advocated that NCAR and CESM should be um, providing more resources for idealized modeling within CESM for the reasons that I outlined, the fact that the models become more expensive and more complex and more difficult to understand as we um, evolve. So in 2015, a couple of configurations were made available. Um, and I'll point you to this website that's listed in that second bullet there. You can find information on all the configurations I'm going to talk about um, at that website. And so this is just a view of our Google Analytics so far. I don't know, I don't know whether these numbers are big or small, but we've had a pretty um, constant uh, number of views over the last few years to our web pages, and the number of available configurations is growing steadily. So I'm just going to go through the configurations that we have, uh, describe them, and give an example of their use. And so for the most part, this is going to focus on the atmospheric component, because that's really where most of the effort so far has gone into idealized modeling. But there are efforts um, in coupled modeling, uh, idealized modeling, that are underway that are I'll talk about a bit toward the end. So here's a schematic depiction of the atmospheric model hierarchy. So on the top right there, you have CAM with no simplifications, so the, the comprehensive atmospheric model. And then as you go down that diagonal line there, those are configurations that have a complete representation of the dynamics, but they have increasingly simplified setups either in terms of their boundary conditions or in the physics package that's used. And then the ones down on the very bottom left, those are configurations where you're really changing the equations of motion that are being solved. We don't have any of the ones that are there on the bottom left. And then off on its own and on the right there is the single column model, which is kind of the inverse of the ones in the diagonal. And it has the full representation of the, of the physics in the column, but it has specified atmospheric circulation, so it's not simulating the atmospheric dynamics. So we've gone quite far in filling out this hierarchy within CESM2, um, so the, the turquoise ones, are they are all available in some release version of CESM2 at this point. Uh, the gray radiation aqua planet there in gray is under development and hopefully will be released some point soon, hopefully within the next, the, by, by the end of the year. So I'm just going to go through each of the ones that we have in turn um, and describe them and, and give an example of their use. So we'll start with the single column model. So I'll use this schematic to kind of depict the full model. And so I haven't included everything here in terms of physical parameterizations. But just to give you a rough idea, so in the full model, we have the dynamical core there on the top left, which is solving Newton's laws on a grid on the sphere. 
And then that's coupled to the suite of physical parameterizations, which are representing subgrid scale processes. And then, of course, at the surface, we have to couple to um, most commonly the land model and then either use prescribed SSTs uh, and sea ice or a coupled ocean and sea ice models. So within the single column atmospheric model, the simplification here is that we don't have the dynamical core. There's uh, circulation is prescribed, uh, but the, the whole of the rest of the column physics is retained. So the single column model is available within CESM2. It's basically just solving the column physics. Uh, with, if you give it the prescribed atmospheric circulation, which is evolving in time and all the associated evection terms that come along with that. Uh, the advantage of SCAM is that it's really cheap to run and you can run it on a laptop. And so uh, Brian Dobbins has developed a containerized version to, where you can just download that container and all the compilers are there and all the input data sets are there. And you can just download that and be up and running pretty quickly on your laptop uh, with SCAM. So SCAM is documented in a number of places. Andrew Gettleman has written a paper. It's documented in the CAM user's guide. And then we have some more comprehensive documentation kind of geared toward new users uh, on the Simpler Models website. So just to give you an example of the use of SCAM, and uh, let me say that I, this is not my area of expertise. I can't really speak to much more than what you see on the slide here. But this is um, an example from Andrew Gettleman looking at the sensitivity to various different degrees of complexity within the Zhang McFarland deep convection scheme. So in the solid line, what you see there is uh, what the default CAM6 does. Uh, the dashed is then what you get if you turn off the deep convection scheme. And so then you don't have any deep convective mass flux in the right hand panel in that case. And then the dotted is what you get if you add in this microphysical scheme within the deep convection scheme. And so what this reveals under this idealized setting where all of the schemes are seeing the large scale circulation being the same, you find that there's pretty similar cloud fraction between them. But then when you add in the microphysics, you have a big change in the deep convective mass flux. And so in this idealized setting, they can re reveal these kind of sensitivities you can get an understanding of how tuning parameters might affect them. And so then you're, when you start to put them into the full model, you have more kind of underlying knowledge of what the sensitivities are and how you might want to fix things that might go wrong. So we do have some future plans for SCAM. At, at the moment, it's just, it's just incorporated with the large scale circulation being completely prescribed. And so that means that the, the, the um, the precipitation can't change because it's it's completely constrained by the vertical motion, which is constrained by the divergence that you're putting in prescribing with the large scale circulation. But you can relax that, and particularly in the tropics, um, and you can parameterize how the vertical motion will respond to heating perturbations using the weak temperature gradient approximation. And there are various different degrees of complexity of that. And so Adam Sobel has got a proposal funded where he intends to incorporate um, various different representations of the weak temperature gradient approximation or these kind of parameterizations within SCAM. So I think it will be exciting to get that in because that will mean that SCAM can then be used for additional climate dynamic studies where you are interested in how precipitation responds to changes within the column. So that's our next steps for SCAM. So moving on to this diagonal here, we'll start with the dry dynamical core. So um, what's done in this configuration is you strip out all of the physics and all of the coupling to the surface, and you replace that with a very simple linear drag of the, zonal, of the temperature field toward a zonally symmetric equilibrium temperature profile. And you remove the boundary layer and replace it with just a simple linear drag on the winds at the lowest levels. So this is set up following the Held and Suarez um, protocol. And the, what you see there on the left is the temperature profile that it's being relaxed towards. And once you spin up the model and you have all the dynamics there affecting the temperatures too, you end up with a pretty reasonable temperature profile and structure of the mid-latitude westerlies. 
And so this model is extremely cheap to run and it's very easy to perturb because you can just change that temperature profile that you're relaxing towards or you can add in heating anomalies uh, very easily. But of course, there's no moisture and none of the physics processes that are there in the full GCM. So this is useful for um, topics where, in particular, in the large scale circulation, that where it's not very highly dependent on moisture. So I have an example here um, from a recent paper by Wen Wen Kong from Berkeley. Uh, and while the model doesn't have moisture, they actually use it to understand the behavior of the Mayu rain band. And so what you see on the left there is precipitation over East Asia. And so as you go into summer, you have this rain band uh, that moves north and intensifies. But once you get into midsummer in the bottom panel there, it is then uh, weakened again. And then on the top, you can kind of see that a bit more clearly. The top panel is showing the average over the region where you can see that rain band, rain band propagating forward and then kind of abruptly going away in the midsummer. And so they were interested in what causes that termination of the rain band. And they hypothesized that what was going on is that the, as, as you get into the summer, the westerlies have moved um, sufficiently far forward of the Tibetan plateau, as you see on the left panels there, um, that they're not interacting with the topography in the same way. And they argue that earlier in the Mayu period, in the top panels, uh, the westerlies interact with the topography, and that gives you northerlies downstream of that, which is on the on the right hand panels, the blue colors there, uh, which leads to convergence and then precipitation. And then once the westerlies move forward of Tibet, the Tibetan plateau, uh, on the bottom panels there, you have a weakening of those northerlies, weakening of the convergence, and reduced precipitation. And so they then went in and tested this behavior in uh, the dry dynamical core in these panels on the right here. And the advantage of this is that you could remove all the complications of the diabatic heating associated with the moist processes. And you could just look at the mechanical influences of the mountains on the circulation. And what they did was they actually moved Tibet rather than moving the westerlies. But you see that as they moved Tibet to the south on the right hand panels, uh, indeed, they get that weakening of the northerlies uh, on the downstream side of the topography. And so then they could go and explore in more detail how these mechanical influences are set up you know, within that idealized setting. So moving on up the hierarchy, we can go to the dynamical core with idealized moisture. Um, and so this is set up following uh, the Thatcher and Jablonowski 2016 paper. And so this is very similar to the dry dynamical core that I just described, but the major increase in complexity here is that now there is a simplified representation of moisture. And so you have an associated heating um, associated with uh, condensation of moisture. So it's basically a water covered earth um, and then it's eva water is evaporated from the surface using simple bulk formulae. It then moves around with the circulation. And then when the specific humidity becomes higher than 100% of the relative humidity, you have condensation and precipitation with associated diabatic heating. So the advantages here is that now you can look at the interactions between precipitation and the circulation. And I think this configuration has been somewhat overlooked so far by the climate dynamics community. I'm not sure that people are quite as well aware of it as they are some of the other configurations, but I think it will be very useful for, for that community. And I hope that people will start using it um, now that it's available. Where this has mostly been used up to now is um, more on the model development side. And that's because this is a, a very simple physics package, but it has some moist processes. And so it allows you to look at aspects of coupling between the dynamics and the physics within the model. And so I have an example here from Christian Jablonowski um, and, and what they have been looking at in terms of uh, numerical processes within the dynamical core and the utility of this configuration. So on the top panel there, um, this is not the simplified model. What you see there is the, the full physics version of CAM using the spectral element dynamical core. And this is the 850 hectopascal vertical velocity. And so you see those kind of ringing features in the vertical velocity, which is not good from a, a numerical point of view. They then ran the same dynamical core with the dry held Suarez. 
um, and or the dry dynamical core, and you don't see that ringing there. So that tells you that it's not just the dynamics. So either it's the physics or it's the coupling between the physics and the dynamics. And so then they could go and look at this in the moist held Suarez configuration. And they find that they did indeed get that ringing there again. And so um, when, once you start to use a physics package that has kind of some representation of precipitation, you start to see these features. And so what they were, um, this is, the right panels now are still the same uh, configuration, the moist held Suarez configuration, and now on the right you see precipitation. And so what they're finding is that you get these kind of intense blobs of precipitation near the equator, and the ringing effect seems to be associated with that. that those blobs are kind of producing gravity waves that are then propagating away and giving you those artifacts. Um, and so then they could use within this idealized framework, figure out how you could kind of stop that from happening and find that if you subset, sub-step the dynamical core, so for each physics time step, you run the dynamics multiple times, then you can more gradually impose the physics tendency associated with the precipitation and you can stop these kind of uh, ringing effects from happening. And so that's what they're doing in the bottom panels there. And so even though you still have those intense blobs of precipitation, you di now don't have those uh, numerical artifacts. And so this is a very cheap and simple and efficient way to go in and dug the, debug these kind of um, physics dynamics coupling problems within the model. So moving on up to the gray radiation aquaplanet, and I, I won't give a science example of this just because it's not within CESM yet, um, but there are many examples of the use of this model within the climate dynamics community. So it was um, developed by Darg and Frierson, and so you can find many examples if you go and look at the papers that have cited his 2006 paper. And so the simplifications here are that it's a slab ocean aquaplanet, so there's no topography, um, there's no clouds, there, you can have a convection scheme, a simplified one, if you want to, uh, but it can also be run without the convection scheme. It has this simplified representation of the moist processes, which is similar to the moist held Suarez that I just described, just moisture moving around and condensing and associated heating. And then the major step up in complexity in this model compared to the ones I've already described is that it does have a radiation scheme. Uh, but it's a very simple gray radiation scheme. There's just incoming shortwave, and then there's one long wave band with one uniform prescribed long wave absorber. So while you have water vapor in the model and it's moving around and giving you that precipitation, the water vapor is not seen by the radiation scheme. Uh, but the, the fact that you have a, a radiation scheme means that you can do kind of simplified global warming experiments. You can increase the uh, concentration of that long wave absorber and it kind of mimics an uh, increase in CO2. So we hope that, that that configuration will be coming soon within CESM. So now we move on up to the radiative convective equilibrium world. Um, and so the simplifications here are really in the boundary conditions. It, it has a, a complete representation of most of the physics. So it's an aquaplanet, there's no topography, and it is uh, spatially uniform prescribed SSTs. Um, and then also it's, there's no spatial gradients in insulation. And in addition, there's no rotation. So the main thing about by this configuration is that you have no forcings of the large scale circulation. So you have kind of no, no order to your large scale flow within this model. Uh, and so this has been implemented by Brian Medeiros and Kevin Reed. So Kevin can probably speak, speak better to this version than I can. Um, it's been implemented following the RCE MIP protocols uh, that are discussed in this Wing et al paper. And so this configuration is useful for studying clouds and convection, climate sensitivity and convective aggregation in kind of a simplified setting where you don't have the complicating factor of uh, large scale forcings of, that organize the large scale circulation. So I have an example of its utility here from a recent paper that was submitted by Alison Wing uh, on the results of this RCE MIP uh, experiments. 
um, and that this involves uh, involves many other people in this paper. And so um, this is obviously not all CESM. CESM is just one of these models. Uh, but what you're seeing here is the change in convective aggregation with warming. And this is achieved by looking at three simulations with different sea surface temperatures at the lower boundary. And so there are three metrics here of convective organization. And so I guess the main points here um, are, and there, I'm sure there's more to this that, that Kevin can probably um, speak to better than I can, but that uh, not all the metrics do the same thing. And uh, furthermore, not all the models agree at all on how convective aggregation would change with warming. And that's even true when you have explicit convection, which seems like it's somewhat surprising. You can either have reductions or you can have increases or not much change. And so these kind of, this kind of, in this idealized setting, you reveal these differences between the representation of these processes by the parameterizations, or indeed in this case, by the explicit convection as well. And that's not something you would be able to see by just looking at the comprehensive GCMs where you have the, you know, organization of the convection by the large scale flow would kind of mask these differences. And so it leads to, identification of interesting differences that it can then be you can then dig into further and try to understand okay so now moving on up to the aqua planet um there this is not that simple of a model the only simplification here is really at the lower boundary where you have a water covered earth uh, and you can either run it with prescribed sea surface temperatures or with the slab ocean. So aside from that, aside from lack of topography, although you can put topography in if you want, um, this model has all of the physics and all of uh, the large scale dynamics present. Um, so this effort has been led by uh, Brian Medeiros and the Aquaplanet is one of the earliest configurations that have been available within CESM. It can be run with prescribed SSTs or a slab ocean. And it's very easy to switch between analytic SST profiles or user specified SSTs. And you can also run it with CAM4, CAM5, or CAM6 physics. So I have an example here of the use of the Aquaplanet from my own work. And the panels here that you see are not using the Aquaplanet. Those are using the fully coupled chemistry Wacom. So a very expensive version of the model. And what this is showing is the response of precipitation to stratospheric sulfate geoengineering. So there's a large ensemble of simulations that are available for anyone to look at that have been run um, with RCP 8.5 forcing out to 2100, but that forcing is offset by sulfate geoengineering. So what you see on the top right there is that under this scenario compared to the present day, you have a, a pattern of precipitation change that kind of looks like wet regions getting drier and dry regions getting wetter. It's a leading order. So kind of from India down into the SPCZ uh, over in the western low latitude Pacific along the northern portion of the ITCZ uh, over Amazonia and then over the Atlantic in the tropics. Those are all regions that have climatologically high precipitation and they show a decline. And then in the eastern tropical Pacific and over Australia, those are drier regions climatologically and they seem to show an increase. So there are exceptions to that rule, but I'd say kind of the leading order pattern here is that when you have sulfate geoengineering in the tropics, wet regions get drier and dry regions get wetter. And so we did some additional experiments, which I won't show here, but where we only imposed the stratospheric heating associated with this sulfate geoengineering and find that we could reproduce a significant fraction of this precipitation response. So that indicated that the dynamical response to stratospheric heating seems like it plays an important role. Uh, and so th that's led me to now really want to understand why does stratospheric heating give rise to this kind of change in precipitation in the tropics? But Wacom is really far too expensive for me to start to play around with that and do idealized experiments to, to figure it out. So I've moved to an aquaplanet framework. So I've just taken the, the aquaplanet but added in a warm pool and a cold tongue by changing the SSTs, uh, which you see in the gray contours there. And so that gives you a kind of localized intense blob of precipitation to mimic the warm pool and then a dry region to the east of that. And, and I'm just showing the five millimeter per day contour there for reference. 
And so we can go and impose the stratospheric heating within this idealized configuration. And we find a kind of a similar picture there that you see that the warm pool, that wet region gets drier, and then you have wetting in those adjacent dry regions. And so I kind of, I'm inferring from this that the same processes that are going on in the couple chemistry Wacom, where you have all the complexity of the continents and the, the, the structure of the tropical precipitation, the same processes seem to be going on in this simplified setting. So I'm now using this to go and dig in and try and understand the mechanisms. And I don't have any answers yet. So far, I've just ruled out all of the hypotheses that, that I had, but um, I wouldn't have been able to do the experiments that I've done in in the comprehensive version of the model. It's, it's much cheaper and simpler to do it in the aquaplanet. Okay, so just a couple of slides now on our next steps. So one of the things we want to do in the near future is implement the simplified land interface model, uh, or SLIM. So this is a simplified land model that was developed by Marisa Legu at the University of Washington for her PhD. Um, and this is kind of going back to the olden days of land modeling. It's just a simple bucket model and you specify the surface properties. And you can download this um, code from a Marisa's GitHub web page, but it's not ready to be released within CESM, but we like to get it in there as a default kind of available setting. And we do have funding now from NSF to do that. And so we should be getting that into a release branch of the models sometime uh, toward the end of the year. Oh yeah, one thing I want to say about that though is that while it is also useful for land atmosphere coupling studies, it's really going to simplify the setup of idealized coupled configurations, which is kind of where we're going next. And so there are efforts underway. Um, Kevin knows all about this. Um, on setting up coupled aquaplanet configurations. So this effort so far is being led by Zhang Wu, who's Kevin's PhD student, and she has been visiting NCAR for the last while working with these folks in the oceanography section. And so their aim is to understand how tropical cyclones affect energy transports within the ocean and the atmosphere, and they want to do that in an idealized setting. So they've been working to set up um, this quasi-aqua world where it's the fully dynamic ocean uh, and it's almost entirely an aqua planet except that you have these land caps at the poles um, which are needed kind of for computational reasons. And then there's also a ridge world where they have a ridge and that allows you to set up um, these gyre circulations. Um, so I guess one of the challenges in this is that when even when you need these tiny little land caps at the poles, you need to set up CLM and configure it. And CLM is very complicated nowadays. So I think that's why getting that simplified land model will, will simplify this kind of um, process uh, a lot. So we really do want to kind of expand this um, coupled idealized capabilities. And one more thing that we just received funding for through a cyber infrastructure call from NSF is to develop kind of toolkits for setting up configurations. So in the schematic there, this is kind of adapted from an example in the literature where just the kind of experiment someone might want to do with idealized models. So suppose you wanted to look at North America's influence on the circulation. You maybe want to have an idealized triangular continent an idealized version of the Rockies. You maybe want to see how does how does it change if you have different land surface types? How does it change if you couple to a dynamic ocean? I mean, it, this is just an example. There are many other ways and things that people might want to look at in this kind of idealized setting. But if you want to set this up, what well, you need to know how to configure the land inputs. You need to know how to set up your own continental geometries. You need to know how to set up your own ocean basins, and then you, you need to know how to kind of um, initialize things and deal with any stability issues that might come up at that point. And so, I mean, I certainly don't know how to do all these things, and I don't think there are many people um, who do, and certainly not outside users. And so what we want to do is develop tools that will kind of lead, guide a user through the seamless setup of these kind of uh, configurations. And this definitely has overlaps with the paleoclimate community because they want to use different continental geometries from the standard ones as well. 
Okay, so to conclude, um, we've expanded a lot the atmospheric model hierarchy within CESM. Uh, our next steps are to extend the capabilities in coupled idealized modeling and also develop these toolkits that will, sorry, that's a typo there, toolkits that will help um, setting up these configurations. And I think at this point, coupled idealized modeling with a comprehensive atmosphere model and a comprehensive ocean model, kind of a state, state of the art versions of those components, I don't think that really has a home at this point. Um, there's been a lot of effort from the University of Exeter with the ISCA framework for idealized atmospheric modeling. And then, of course, there's the MNT-GCM, which is widely used for idealized ocean modeling. Um, but hopefully, if we can get these, these things up and running, CSM can become a place for idealized coupled modeling, where you have components that are kind of state of the art, but you can use them in idealized ways. Of course, and a problem uh, that is an issue everywhere is that resources are always limited, and much of this is really a software engineering exercise. And so, software engineering resources are limited, and they're devoted to both getting the comprehensive CSM up and running, which is obviously something we have to be doing, and at the same time, um, helping to get these idealized configurations up and running. But we have had some funding from NSF and that has increased now with the cyber infrastructure funding. So um, we're grateful for that. Uh, and we do hope to see continued and increased use of these configurations just to kind of ensure that they are continually supported. So that's all I have. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Isla. So I'm looking at the time right now, and we have about 20 minutes for the closed panel discussion. So I think if it's okay with everyone, um, if you're not part of the PISNET panel, but you do have questions for Isla, to maybe save it and send it to her through an email or contact her separately, is that okay? Because um, I would like to have enough time for the panel discussions with Isla as well. Sorry if I overrun. <laughs> oh, you're okay. Yeah, unless there's one maybe burning question from somebody that isn't on the panel. And since nobody seems to, to, to have a burning question, then yeah, I think maybe we can just go to the panel. Okay, great. So anyone who is part of the PISNET panel, including Shadong, uh, please stay on. And then everyone else, or and Isla, obviously stay on. Um, and then everyone else, um, thank you for joining. And we'll send out the recording of this um, probably next week. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see start seeing people drop off. Um, if not, I will use my magical presenter powers to kick people out. Um, yeah, it looks like, well, we can go to that looks like we have a few, a few stragglers, but maybe you can take care of that, Jenny. Um, okay, so yeah, let's uh, maybe move to the closed panel part here. and 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 so, I guess we should open it up first if there's any questions from the panel members, um, maybe, re you know, related to the talk, um, but then it would be nice to kind of also start to talk about this in, in context of, of some of our ongoing activities in, in Pismet. Um, so, Kevin, I, this is Charlotte. I do have a question for Isla. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that really nice overview of all these available tools with CESM. Um, one question I had is, are there plans or capabilities that perhaps you didn't discuss for adding coupling to a one-dimensional ocean mixed layer model, either in the SCAM or in some of these global configurations? Yeah, so there have been um, efforts using trying to get this pencil model up and run with which I think is what you're describing, basically column, just column models at each grid point in the ocean. So you have right. all the mixing. Um, I think there have been complications. So I'm not, I think uh, it is up and running. 
but I know that Young Kwan and Amy Clement and Jim Benedict have been working on that, and I'm not sure where it is yet. I haven't heard any um, kind of rumors that it's imminently going to be ready and available. Um, I think there have been a lot of complications in trying to get it up and running. So, I yeah, I don't know where it's at. I mean, if there's a lot of interest in that, it's good good to know that, I guess, maybe to try and push that along. And I, I'm not up to date on what the issues have been, but there okay. definitely people are thinking about it. Great. So Jim Benedict actually works in the same building that I do. All right. the time. So uh, yeah, he will know. I may just be able to walk downstairs and ask him directly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. He's he would be the person to ask. Great. Hi, this is Antonietta. Uh, Yevic. Uh, comment um, question <laughs> can I go ahead or yeah sure. yeah so Ayla this was uh, wonderful thank you so much I didn't know about all these uh, activities going on at NCAR and in the broader community for uh, uh, these more idealized uh, um, configurations so one question I had is that one uh, possibility that could actually also be helpful another maybe a um, framework that could be helpful would be to use like uh, empirical models, like linear inverse model. This is, can be particularly useful in couple settings, uh, but maybe even in your uh, like aqua planet with uh, sea surface temperature or uh, slab ocean. Because uh, um, I think while you want to understand the, the, proce the processes and how they uh, work together, I think, um, in a couple setting, it's also important to understand how uh, correct the feedbacks are, and that's what some of these empirical models can give you. So it could be kind yeah. of a complementary uh, kind of effort um, that could be applied to any of these TSM configurations. Yeah, so you mean you, you could kind of generate are you, you can train, yeah, yeah. yeah you or, can train like you can train a, an empirical model on observation or a model output and actually could be also a very uh, inexpensive way to compare the, the what you get from the models with uh, some observational counterpart mm, so so it would be kind of more of a diagnostic tool or you would use it to kind of force the model somehow? I think it would be more like a diagnostic tool, but I yeah. think it ultimately yeah. is a model that you can also run <laughs> for for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about. I think I mean that strikes me as kind of something that could could stand on its own. It seems like it wouldn't necessarily need to be within the CESM framework is that yeah I mean you can do you can use it on any different in yeah you can use it on yeah. or, uh, but I think it could be a useful diagnostic tool for also yeah. With the CESM yeah definitely yeah I know that the, I think Matt Newman had a project where he did want to use the limb to make SST evolutions and then force the model with those and mm -hmm. um, heard about it in that sense yeah, um, but I think you can yeah. be more, yeah, also in terms of diagnosing uh, the feedbacks between yeah. okay. different components. Yeah, we yeah, can talk that would be, offline. That would be yeah, sounds good. So Isla, this is, uh, this is uh, Patrick Taylor. I was a uh, great presentation. I was curious if, uh, so there's lots of these idealized simulations and setups for tropical kind of investigations. I was curious, and I don't have any exact ideas off the top of my head, but has there been any talk within this working group about anything that could be directly applicable to the Arctic or maybe simplifying sea ice parameterization or anything like that that we could uh, work into one of these frameworks? Um. Yeah, I think there ha we have mostly so far it's been well things started out on the atmospheric side and now um, oceanographers have become entrained into the effort. Um, I guess yeah we not have had, had haven't had any real discussions about 
simplified sea ice. But I think one of the things that we wanted to do within our kind of these tools that we're going to develop is to make make it make people aware of the simplifications that you can make within the the individual components. Like for example, I, I I'm pretty sure that right now you can make the sea ice model become just the thermodynamic sea ice model without all of the additional you know other things that go on in terms of the dynamics. But I think at this point it's not perhaps not obvious to a non expert how you would do that. And then also what pitfalls you might come across if you do that. Like are there certain things that the ocean model needs that it wouldn't get from that kind of sea ice model or things like that. So our hope is that these tools will be dealing with those kind of situations and make it clear what simplified um, models, what simplifications you can make with the models that are available. In terms of developing new simplified models for the sea ice, uh, that's not something that we have discussed. Okay. Though, though it is worth it, it is worth mentioning that um, in the that at the very end when Isla was talking about this kind of global coupled model that's an aquaplanet setting, it does it does actually have sea ice as well as the ice sheet model on. Um, so it it so of course it's the full complexity of it, but you are able to kind of run fully coupled, you know century-long plus simulation we're interested in some in some potential feedbacks uh, but it won't necessarily obviously be realistic and there is this issue where we have uh, a continent at the pole as opposed to open ocean with ice on it um, which hopefully will be mitigated in the future if the grid of the ocean model changes from a lat long grid to a cube sphere grid which will allow us to actually get rid of those continents good to know yeah hi this is uh, Samson Hagos uh, nice presentation, Ayla. Um, I was wondering if there is any uh, similar activity elsewhere. Um, seems like what you are doing is a very uh, good uh, opportunity uh, for um, understanding origins of uh, model diversity as well, to try to see how far back this uh, uh, intermodal spread uh, go back in terms of uh, dynamical cores or specific physics and so on. Is there any activity elsewhere? Um, well, there's the ISCA framework, which has come from the GFDL model. That's where really like the Held and Suarez dry dynamical core started there uh, within the GFDL model. And many people still use it within there, but it's kind of you have to know someone who knows where the code is to, to get that. But ISCA is now at the, Jeff Vallis, when he moved, to the University of Exeter, he's made that kind of an open source and um, easy to use framework for the idealized atmospheric modeling. But that doesn't sit within uh, the framework of a kind of continually developing state of the art model. It's like not within the GFDL model, it's within a separate thing. Um, and I, I'm sure, I mean, many other places have they have these setups like there there is some many models contributing to the RCE MIP. Many other the Max Planck people are commonly using the Aquaplanet framework within that model. So I think there are efforts uh, here and there, and um, but maybe less so on these kind of the the next things we're going to do in terms of developing the tools and for this kind of idealized coupled modeling. I'm not sure that that's done anywhere else. Thank you. Hi, hello, this is Uwe. Uh, very nice talk. So um, my question is that, um, yeah, I really appreciate the simpler model, especially in the atmosphere, but I'm just wondering, since running high resolution model, coupled model is expensive. So um, benefit from the simpler atmosphere, can we possibly, uh, allow the uh, high resolution in the ocean? For example, simpler atmosphere, but any resolve ocean. Is there some plan in that? Um, well, I guess, I mean, one thing that Kevin has been doing in his coupled efforts is they have been using an older physics package. They've been using CAM4 physics. The motivation being that that is much cheaper to run, and so you can use higher resolution. Um, I think, like, within these tools we want to make it clear what grids can be coupled to what and what you need to do to to achieve that so then it should be possible 
to the to the degree that it's possible within the in the numerics to run a lower resolution atmosphere with a higher resolution ocean. Um, yeah, but hopefully, I mean, you could also choose a cheaper physics package like Camp Four, mm -hmm. as long as that's available uh, okay. for that purpose. Okay. Thank you very much. So I like this is Mike Patterson. Just a couple questions um, on the um, with all this discussion about the possible additional setups um, in the toolbox, if you will. Um, what's the avenue by which the community can propose, and it's determined what will go forward um, in the CSM idealized model set? Yeah, so this is something that is often discussed. And um, at this point, there's not really, well, we we have said that if, if a configuration is going to be incorporated, it needs to kind of have, have a publication where someone has described it. Uh, there's a, an article that was led by Lorenzo Povani, a BAMS article that kind of laid out what we saw as being the necessary things uh, before an incorporation. A configuration is considered to be incorporated um, and we do have a mailing list and the website and um, so if anyone's interested in joining the mailing list they can find out about that and they can get in touch with people that way too um, but I guess the main there isn't like a formal process and the main thing is where the resources are coming from and so one of the things that um, the, the way, for example, we, we're getting the slim, the land model into CESM is that, well, Marisa had made it, but it, there were no software engineering resources that could be devoted to it. But then I was writing a proposal with Karen McKinnon at UCLA to NSF where we wanted to use the model. And NSF obviously doesn't give, well, in the climate, uh, AGS doesn't give funding to NCAR, but they would give a few months of software engineering resources to NCAR to get that model incorporated. So there have been a couple of situations where it's happened that way, where someone writes a proposal to the Climate and Large Scale Dynamics program and asks for resources, obviously with collaboration with people at NCAR, and that's how things have got in. And aside from that, it's really been a group of us that have, at this point, just gone for kind of the main configurations that we know people are using. We definitely don't want it to expand massively because every time a new model is made, like a new version of the model, there's all these like tests on the software engineering side. And it, 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 the more configuration you have, the bigger the burden there is there. So we're trying to keep it to kind of these like default configurations plus tools that you could use to kind of modify those. Um, so yeah, I, I think if, if it really started to grow a lot, then we would need to come up with some kind of process. But at this point, there aren't really resources that are devoted to it. So it's really a matter of where the resources are available for particular configurations. Right, so, so if a PI out of the university, for example, came forward with an idea, some of the ideas that were just uh, discussed, um, they they would have opportunity, I guess, to partner with an NCAR uh, participant to put forward a proposal to NSF for for um, development of a new idealized approach. Yeah. So yeah. so there's nothing to limit um, the community at large at developing new capability here. Um, at this point, no. I I guess if it grew big, then I could I could see the kind of CSM steering committee wanting to have a bit more control over what's put in, um, but we haven't got to that point. And obviously, like when these when someone does contact us, um, or in the case of Slim, I checked with the CSM chief scientist whether it was okay to pursue this. So yeah things have to be run past the people that are in charge um right right they have yeah they have their board um and what the other question i had had to do with your last point here in terms of um increased use of these configurations 
And yeah. is there something that U.S. Cyber can do to help promote their availability? Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, sending out, well, making people aware of the website, I guess. I mean, we're, we are doing what we can. I think we've had a couple of town halls at the AOFD meeting, which is where many of the users gather. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think on the, we've had this, a couple of sessions at the CESM workshop, but if you're not in either of those communities, you might not be aware of this. And so, yeah, making people aware would be great, pointing them to the I website. Follow up with, yeah, Jenny and I can follow up with you offline um, to talk about how to do that effectively right. through yeah. our vehicle. So, so yeah. even related to that, that topic, I mean, um, you know, could, you know, another way to, to broaden at least under, you know, the, I guess the, the application and to be aware is, you know, even if U.S. Clybar was to advertise some of this stuff, you know, it still might not be that readily understood to people that focus on process studies or, or field campaigns or even kind of theory uh, of tying it really in into kind of what these models could be used for. And so there, there is potential actually for the U.S. Clybar to potentially you know, or at least a group of people to to think about a working group of somehow, you know, now that we have these tools, how can we make them, you know, even more uh, useful to the broader community? Something like a workshop where you bring together, you know, more than just people that are interested in idealized modeling, but people that are maybe, you know, using these models and, and, and forecast setups that might realize that, you know, they could study some of the, the processes they're interested in and some different, comp um, uh, I guess, uh, configurations and so I think we could just definitely think about ways to even be broader in, in that because of course you can increase you know the education so more people know about it but still some people you know oftentimes with information people don't know sometimes you don't know the information that you need and you just kind of already self tune out stuff that doesn't seem relevant directly to what you've been doing um, mm -hmm. so I think we could think about that as a panel especially something we should consider at our discussion later this summer. Um, I think I wanted to maybe ask one more question, um, or to ask a question as we as we kind of finish up here. And, and so one of the things uh, I love that this panel has been interested in and recently, and, and you're aware of this in part because you presented remotely at our, our meeting last year, is we're kind of interested in, in CMIP 6 and the progress that CMIP 6 has made from CMIP 5 and then going into the future um, of what the CMIP process should be um, and I'm curious if you have any insight to maybe what the role of simpler models play um, uh, in a future CMIP process as part of it I mean I understand that aqua planets are part of the CF MIP, for example um, but is there a broader role for for these models in understanding um, uh, do you think in some in, in CMIP or or just more generally? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess there there are clear examples of where they're useful, like you mentioned CF MIP and the RCE MIP. I I don't think I have a an answer, but one thing that, that I I wish we could somehow do is then really clearly relate the results from those idealized configurations back right. to the full model because like RCE MIP is really interesting you see all those differences but then how do you then relate that to to the way in which those models behave in the future or maybe it maybe it doesn't relate to it it's just revealing differences in the schemes when you view them in this simplified setting um, yeah. I'm not I don't know how you do that but it seems like one of the key things that might be a little bit missing from some of the more idealized components of CMIP. Right. And, and and so maybe one another way to ask a question it would be um, you know that there, there's been a lot of effort, you know a lot of effort within CG and CGD and NCAR and a lot of other modeling centers in the US and globally is focused on creating the next version right to create the CSM2 compared to C and I know that you've done some work to suggest what what some of those improvements have been perhaps in mid latitude dynamics and things like but do you see these these kind of simpler model frameworks as an ability to actually understand, you know, if there was an improvement in CSM2 or in CAM6 compared to CAM5, 
Um, do you think these frameworks are one of the ways in which you can actually understand why, you know, what process, what inclusion in the model actually helped in the that that improvement? Um, because you know, when we look when we look at these things holistically, it's really hard oftentimes to understand if there's actually been any improvement in the multi-model ensemble from CAM from CMIP three to five to six. Um, and so coming up with areas where we do see improvement and trying to explain why that is, I think maybe it might help focus future development um, for CMIP 7, for example. Yeah. Um, I think there could be a question, so don't feel yeah. obligated. I mean, I, yeah, so I think in many cases it's, it's hard to link back these changes. I mean, there's a, like many of the changes that we see in the circulation. I mean, we don't, it's not obvious where they've come from at all, right? And it's like just everything is just kind of combined together to give you something that somehow looks a bit better. And so, and the ideal, I'm not sure how you pull that apart with the, the idealized frameworks, but for Dirk, I'm sure there are certain things. Like one example I can think of is that I think one of the changes we see in the storm tracks is due to changes in the orographic blocking schemes. And so I could imagine then wanting to go in and do maybe in an aqua planet, have kind of an idealized mountain with, with that blocking scheme turned on and off and explore the dynamics there in a simplified setting without changing, you know, the, topo the behavior of the topography all over the world, which is then, you know, if you change Tibet, then you're changing the incident flow on the Rockies and you don't know what's causing what. So I think that would be kind of the kind of thing that you can get at with the simplified models. Yeah, and, and I think just to kind of finish up, I mean, I think, you know, you use the, the Isaacs 2005 paper as somewhat of a motivation for the interest in simple models, but, you know, I think the one thing that still is missing to some extent, um, so you can use simpler models for but there still then is a disconnect between the simple models and the comprehensive models in terms of how can we build that understanding into the comprehensive model or try to explain behavior in the, the whole comprehensive model. Because in the end, those are the models that are being used for, for decision making potentially in the future, not the simple yeah. model, right? And so I think that there's still a gap there that, that is probably the, the even more difficult gap to, to kind of rectify. Yeah, I definitely think we have to be careful. And there, there are clear examples where the simplifications, like one example I can think of is the Polvania Kushner and the dry dynamical core response to the ozone hole. And they, I mean, what they showed was was relevant, but they showed a massive response to warming. And the, the model was just in this particular regime where it kind of jumped. And we now know that. But yeah, we definitely have to be careful about tying things back. But I think there are cases where we can. Like, I feel like the aquaplanet example that I showed, if I can understand things there, I, I feel like I'd be pretty confident that it, I'm understanding what's relevant for the pool model. Great. All right. Well, I think we're a few minutes over. So, uh, I mean, at first, I'll, I'll thanks, uh, thank you for the, the very interesting talk. And I think it's led to some good conversations here that should set us up for some panel business and discussions um, in the coming months. Um, so, thank you for your time. Thanks to everybody for calling in and participating. Um, and uh, well, thank you, Isla. And we'll see everybody, I guess, next webinar is two weeks from today. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Isla.